Oh, heck, I'm on. Okay, good. Hello. Um, it's great to be here. Welcome to me and my new lockdown haircut, um, which I did myself and you can't tell. Um, let's just get me off the screen and move over to the slides. That's that. Yes, there it is. Okay, so here we go. The evolution of computing. Ever since a caveman first wished he could download a guide to how to sous vide a woolly mammoth, we have dreamed of computing. Some say it started with Jacquard and his programmable loom. Others remember Hero of Alexandria and his strings and pulleys driven automata. But surely the first attempt at building a computer was Stonehenge, which might have been a kind of computer and you can't prove it wasn't. Stonehenge, built 5,000 years ago on the plains of Salisbury, almost certainly as a crop planting calculator that was powered by the sun and also blood. Archaeologists believe it took a one and a half thousand years to build, which you might think is a long time, but try getting IBM to provision a new 1U rack server in a private data center. Even today, we can learn from the architects of Stonehenge. They started out with a monolith and then gradually refactored to microliths, but the monolith was never actually taken out of production. Over the centuries, humankind has built countless machines to calculate, work and entertain. In 1901, the Antikythera mechanism was retrieved from a shipwreck off the coast of a Greek island. It dates to around 150 BC and contained a complex series of gears to predict the motion of the sun and the moon through the heavens. Sadly, at the same time that the Greeks invented such complex machinery, they also invented subprime mortgages, and the resulting collapse of the Greek civilization meant that the technology was lost. It was, would not be recreated until the 14th century. In England, in 1330, Richard of Wallingford built a clock that showed the positions of the sun, moon, stars, and planets. It also had a wheel of fortune and predicted the tides at London Bridge, which meant that it had more apps than Windows Phone. But programmable machines would not come until much later. In 1725, Frenchman Basile Bouchon invented a way to control a loom with perforated paper tape, which was built upon by other Frenchmen, culminating with the punch card driven Jacquard loom in 1805. The Jacquard loom was successful with factory owners because it was more accurate, more reliable, and never inconveniently died of cholera. Punch cards were first used for information storage by Semyon Korsakov in the Russian Empire in 1832. Korsakov designed several machines for the comparison of ideas, including this ideoscope. The Imperial Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg rejected his application, possibly because he was also a noted homeopath and therefore definitely not a scientist. Charles Babbage also proposed using punch cards as information storage for his computing engines. Babbage is also notable for being the first computer engineer to fail halfway through a project because he had a better idea and started all over again. Babbage never built his analytical engine, but that didn't stop Ada Lovelace from writing the world's first computer program for it, an algorithm for calculating Bernoulli numbers, which she needed to calculate how high an Italian plumber can jump before and after eating a giant mushroom. In 1890, the US census was processed using punch card based electromechanical tabulators invented by Herman Hollerith, whose tabulating machine company was eventually amalgamated into the Computing Tabulating Recording Company, which in 1924 would become IBM, the groundbreaking company that pioneered so many innovations in both computer science and outlandish consultancy fees. The first working programmable computer was the Z1 built in 1936 by Konrad Zuse in his parents' flat in Berlin. I'm not making that up, he really built it in his parents' flat, and he built the Z2 there too. Eventually, his parents got fed up with stepping on bits of floating point register in their bare feet and rented him a workshop across the street where he, rented, where he built the Z3, which was the first Turing complete computer, although he didn't know that at the time. Zeus also invented a self-constructing and deconstructing tower called the Helix Tower, which sounds awesome, but when I went to the Deutsches Museum's website to get a video of it, I found this message, which at least demonstrates their commitment to ancient history. 
The Second World War pushed computer development forward fast as we tried to decode encrypted messages and calculate shell trajectories. In Britain, Tommy Flowers, winner of the Most British Name of 1943 competition, built the Colossus computers to help decrypt Lorenz ciphers. The Colossus used vacuum tubes and was the first electronic digital computer. But after the war, all but two of the machines were dismantled and the design documents were burned because secrets. Britain also built the first stored program computer, the Manchester Baby, in 1948. The Baby used cathode ray tubes as memory and could process 1,100 instructions per second, which is 1,097 more than an actual baby. The first real computer in the United States was the ENIAC, which was built to help the war effort and came online in December 1945, four months after the war ended. It was developed further until 1956, and by the end of its lifetime, it contained 20,000 vacuum tubes and weighed nearly 30 tons. So basically, it looked like your hipster friend's hi-fi. The ENIAC and its successors, the EDVAC and then the UNIVAC, led to the commercial computer industry, which IBM mainframes came to dominate. The IBM 700 series still used vacuum tubes, but by the end of the 1950s, transistors were used instead. Transistors were preferred to vacuum tubes because they were small, cheap, and didn't explode every couple of days. In 1957, IBM introduced the first computer with a hard disk, the IBM 305 Raymac. The 350 disk unit was the size of two refrigerators and held an enormous 3.75 megabytes of data. Around this time, high-level programming in languages were introduced, such as Fortran and COBOL. This is Hello World in Fortran. This is Hello World in COBOL. This is Hello World in IBM COBOL. Both languages are still in use today. Fortran because of its superior mathematical and scientific capabilities, and COBOL because COBOL programmers have a really good union. At first, programs were batch processed. Programmers would write their code and stamp it into punch cards, then send them to the mainframe operators to be run and would receive the results a few days later. If your program failed, the young lad delivering the printouts would yeet them at your head. To this day, we still talk about throwing and catching exceptions. Batch processing was slow and inefficient, and as computers got more powerful, time sharing was introduced, allowing computers such as the IBM Model 709 and the DEC PDP-11 to crash multiple processes at the same time. Time sharing allowed customers to run their programs on huge computers miles from their offices without having to worry about the expense of buying and maintaining hardware themselves. One of the first time-sharing operating systems was Multics, developed by MIT with Bell Labs and General Electric. Multics is most famous for being a massive failure, which is only mostly true. Bell Labs pulled out of the project, and several of their developers created a parody of Multics called Unix, which accidentally became massively successful. In the 1960s, integrated circuits were invented with a large number of transistors on a single chip. And by large, I mean hundreds. This unprecedented miniaturization made computers smaller and lighter than ever before. For example, the Apollo guidance computer had four kilobytes of RAM, a one megahertz processor, and weighed only 32 kilograms. That's 70 pounds for the Americans in the room. Integrated circuits. <clears throat> this is a cut open example of a very early integrated circuit. Integrated circuits evolved into microprocessors in the early 1970s with Intel's 4004 microprogrammable computer on a chip. The 4-bit 4004 had 2,250 10 micrometer transistors and ran at 740 kilohertz. Intel followed the 4004 with the 4040, then switched to 8-bit processors with the 8008 and then the 8080, which is where things really kicked off. The Intel 8080 was used in the Altair 8800, the first popular microcomputer. The Altair could be bought in kit form for only $439 and kick-started the home computing revolution. It also inspired Bill Gates and Paul Allen to found Microsoft and invent closed source software, selling their Altair basic compiler for $150. We had to wait 20 years for people to invent open source software again. The 8080 was also used in early arcade games, including Space Invaders. 
Fun fact. The reason space invaders moved faster, as you shot more of them, was that there were fewer space invaders to move, so the system could move them faster. True story. Competition sprang up with the 8080 compatible Z80 CPU from Zilog and the Motorola 6800, and then the 6502 from MOS Technology, which was used in computers like the Commodore 64 and the Apple 1 and 2. The Apple Computer Company was founded by Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, and Roland Wayne on April 1st, 1976. Twelve days later, Roland Wayne sold his 10% stake in the company back to Jobs and Wozniak for $800, a decision he continues to insist he does not regret. In the UK, the 6502 was used by the Acorn Computer Company to build the BBC Micro, commissioned by the BBC for their computer literacy project. The BBC Micro was used to teach a generation of British children to code, and also to hack the Econet network to get access to the teacher's computer and install Repton. Acorn also created a prototype RISC processor add-on for the BBC Micro called the Acorn RISC Machine, or ARM-1. In 1978, Intel released the 16-bit 8086 processor, which became the basis for the IBM PC. The PC was the first computer IBM built with off-the-shelf parts, and they expected it to be a niche market. They contracted Microsoft to build the operating system in a deal that allowed Microsoft to also sell the software to other companies. The PC was immediately cloned by companies like Dell and Compaq, and enjoys modest success to this day. Some of the most exciting work in the late 1970s was happening at Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center. Xerox Park gave the world the graphical user interface after foolishly inviting Steve Jobs over one afternoon. Xerox Park researchers also created Ethernet. Ah, yes, networking. The ARPANET project was started in 1966 to link computers across the United States. In 1969, there were four nodes, the Stanford Research Institute, UC Santa Barbara and UCLA, and apparently the Church of Mormon. By 1977, there were 60 nodes on the network, and a new network protocol had to be invented to cope with this complexity. It was actually two protocols. The transmission control protocol handled messages as packets of bytes, and the internet protocol passed the packets between nodes. TCPIP's numeric addressing system could cope with over 4 billion nodes, far more than could ever possibly be needed. At some point in the 1980s, ARPANET evolved into the internet and was primarily used by academic institutions to have arguments about which was better, Emacs or VI. It was VI. Don't at me. For a long time, the internet was text-based, with email, Usenet, and Listserv. It wasn't until 1989 that Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web, which he made public in 1991 with the noble dream of a second enlightenment. Thanks, Tim. By this time, we were on the Intel 8486, a 32-bit processor with a built-in floating point unit. Before the 486, floating point units were sold as coprocessors for people who needed to calculate that 5 times 20 5 times 4.99 is 24.944444444449. The 486 had 20, 275,000 1 micrometer transistors. Yes, I have this written down, don't blame me. Time sharing was a thing of the past. Offices had their own servers and computers on every desk, running Windows 3.11 for work groups so people could play hearts over the network. PCs had become so small and light by this point that some of them could be folded up and carried over your shoulder, with only occasional visits to a chiropractor to correct the deformation of your spine. But even smaller computers were becoming common with the advent of personal digital assistants like the Palm Pilot and Apple's Newton, which was based on an ARM processor and was the second worst thing Apple ever made. By the mid 90s and here is the first worst thing Apple ever made. By the mid-1990s, ordinary people were getting onto the World Wide Web, and companies like eBay, PayPal, and Amazon were launching their state-of-the-art websites. Investors realized the value of a company could be orders of magnitude greater if it had .com in its name, and fortunes were made. 
and then they were lost again, as it turned out that dog food is never worth a billion dollars, even if you sell it online. As the web grew, finding things on it became more difficult, and in 1998, a new search engine launched that promised to find you the most re relevant results in exchange for knowing everything about you. By now, computers were becoming incredibly powerful. In 1997, IBM's deep blue supercomputer beat world champion Garry Kasparov at chess, and everybody agreed that that was $100 million well spent. As the year 2000 approached, programmers all over the world scrambled to fix the Y2K bug. And for once in our lives, we did such a good job that afterward, afterwards, everyone else said, so that Y2K bug turned out to be a load of rubbish. Why did we spend so much money fixing that? With the new millennium came the Web 2.0, based on the premise that access to publication enjoyed by academics and subject matter experts should also be available to idiots because what could possibly go wrong? Social networks appeared, including Facebook, which one-upped Google by get just getting you to type all your personal information straight into it, and Twitter, which one-upped SMS by letting you text everybody in the world to let them know you were making sourdough bread. In 2006, Amazon realized, sorry, that was Twitter's original homepage. I'm just scrolling and moving slides and doing all sorts of stuff, and it's really hurting my brain. Uh, uh, so yes, where were we? In 2006, Amazon realized that they had too many servers, so they started renting them to random people, and cloud computing was born. This brand new innovation that had never been seen before, cloud computing allowed customers to run their programs on huge computers miles from their offices without having to worry about the expense of buying and maintaining hardware themselves. That sounds familiar. Never mind. In 2007, Apple built a phone into an MP4 player and created a world in which staring at phones all day seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Eventually, the effort of holding your phone while you looked at it proved to be too much, and people started strapping phones directly to their heads to get the experience of watching Netflix in an alpine cabin through a screen door. Artificial intelligence has now progressed to the point where cheap, tiny computers can understand speech, play games, drive cars, and do basically anything a human being can do, except faster and better and without stopping to update their status every five minutes. Modern processors contain billions of transistors, 10,000 times smaller than those first integrated circuits. That phone in your pocket is a million times more powerful than the Apollo guidance computer that landed men on the moon. But of course, you still want a new one. And the internet, for its many faults, has created a world in which billions of people all around the globe can stay connected, even as they have to stay apart. That ran a little bit shorter than I was expecting it to, by like about seven minutes. So I'm just going to talk for a bit now. Um, so yes, I could probably have fit more stuff in there because, you know, there was a load of stuff. But I think some of my favorites in there, that's the hard disk, the IBM 350 hard disk. And that was 3.75 megabytes. And it was probably the size of the room I'm sitting in right now. And now you can get a tiny little micro SD card that can hold a terabyte of information. Um, and we've just... And it keeps accelerating and accelerating and Moore's law, they keep trying to make Moore's law stay true. And it's just fantastic. And I, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about what's going to come next with quantum computing and augmented reality and our phones being replaced with just a pair of glasses that can project things onto the world all about us. And I get really, really excited about it. And so I love sharing this sort of thing with everyone. But Anyway, that is basically it from me. If you enjoyed that, then please keep watching. Please donate to help us raise money for the uh, COVID relief uh, organization. Um, I hope the rest of the day goes well, and I hope you all enjoy yourselves. Stay safe, take care of each other, 
and I hope to see you in real life sometime soon. Thank you, and back to our hosts.